All right. Good evening and welcome to the shop here in Canterbury, New Hampshire. It's getting warm. Summer is coming. So I'm glad to have you stop by and enjoy this evening with us. You know, I was thinking about what to do tonight and I got a, an email from someone, you know who you are, who was said they were having trouble with their spoke shave and did I have any kind of videos on spoke shave use? And I stopped and thought about it and thought, you know, we've never done one. So I've used a spoke shave many times in demonstrations and during courses and just pick it up and start using it and never thought to focus on just tuning and some of the tips about using it. So that's what we're going to do tonight. And as I said in my description, Every now and then, people ask, what's your favorite tool to use? And it is the spoke shave, actually, because of the freedom and the creativity that is right there in your fingers. It's kind of a free form tool. It doesn't limit you as much as some others, where you know planes are pretty much in the flat surface. But this, you can shape all kinds of um, objects and shapes and all that. So, I am uh, looking forward to talking about this tonight. And I do want to tell you, though, that I approach tool use and explanation as a maker. I, am, I like tools. I, you probably know I, I, li I really love tools. I love using them. But I, I'm not one of those people who obsess about all the different brands and which one's better. I do. I have, I guess I have over the years. You know what's expensive and I just want to say that you don't have to get the very top of the line to do the work. So tonight what I want to show you is how I use tools to do the work. That's what I'm way more interested in. I'm way more interested in the design and the making of beautiful objects and the tools are a means to get there. So I'm interested in them for ease and efficiency but you don't have to have the finest top of the line. It's not bad to get them, and quite often they hold value, so if you can afford them, there's nothing, no shame in having a fine, fine tool. And I have some very fine ones too. Most of them were gifts to me. <laughs> but I also have uh, some tools I love that are old time, and that's the category of my spoke shaves. So just a reminder, if you enjoy this content, Go ahead and subscribe. It helps us out, and it doesn't cost you a thing. And if you turn on the notifications, is that the bell thing? I think it is. That is the bell. Yeah, so you ring the bell. You turn on notifications, you get no notified when we post a new video, and it's all good. So, um, so that's our topic for tonight. And what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Other, one other announcement. Next Thursday night is our 100th episode of Shop Night Live. Wow. wow. Crazy, huh? 100. So crazy. I didn't think I had that much to talk about, but we're just getting started. <laughs> but also with the courses we have going, it feels like we're really having a, a, a productive time here in the shop. We just finished up the writing desk course this past Tuesday night and you can swing over and look at the condition it's in. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed because anyone who was at that course I said I was gonna finish it but I haven't done anything on it yet because I've been getting ready for Saturday's course and <laughs> tonight but I will have this done. So this is not finished finished but it's very close. The finish has been started on the legs. The top I'm going to be uh, actually doing a spoke shave treatment around this edge. And I'll demonstrate uh, various methods with the spoke shave. And it came in quite handy on this piece. But next Thursday night will be the unveiling of this finished writing desk. So I'm excited for that. The, uh, we've, we had quite a few uh, attendees to that course. And I did promise them that it would be done. So. I, I operate best on deadlines. Maybe some of you are like me. You need a good deadline to get you highly energized. <laughs> well, 
What I want to say about uh, spoke shaves is there's, there's quite a number of styles and shapes that you can use. There's um, the general flat sole. That's probably the most common, having a so flat sole like that. And because the sole is short, it allows you to get into areas that a longer like block plane can't access. So you have a lot of creativity and access with this. I often compare it to a vegetable peeler on steroids, really, because it's really rigid, and, but it is the similar action to peeling a potato or an apple or a carrot, whatever you're into. You know? <laughs> I won't judge you. But, you know, so it's, it's as if you're doing that, but you get the two-handed approach to it, um, and it's so much tougher. It can handle all kinds of texture of wood. But the flat sole is the most common. Now, the, um, another one that you see probably of the shapes is the, let's see, convex shape to get into concave curves. Um, and this one has a curved base. Now, I have this, but I don't use it a whole lot. I'll show you a little spot where I'll use it a little later. But they're a little more difficult to use because you can't reference quite as accurately off the sole if, if that curve is, differs from the curve on the sole, which it probably will, it will rock somewhat. Whereas a flat-soled spoke shave is resting on the work. So it references and indexes the proper angle for the blade to cut. So you tend not to get chatter as much as you will get with a curved one. So they come curved this way. They also come curved this way. And there's V-shaped to chamfer. There's a whole myriad of options. And if you go online, you'll find a bunch of those. And then there's a whole other um, subset of spoke shaves that I'm not going to get into tonight because I don't use them much, but I, I don't um, down them. They were the initial spoke shaves that were around, and they are wooden spoke shaves. So they're, they're a little different. They're a little harder to set up. Um, but there are some on the market that are beautiful and, um, you know, contemporary. So some of them have knurled nut adjustments with them. That's one of the challenges with one of these old ones is that it's a little primitive in that you have to set it by, you know, just tapping to set the depth of the cutter. And there's probably some tricks to this that... I'm not that familiar with because I don't use these very much. But it's it's like any tool. Once you get it, if it's a if it can do the work, you will get familiar, and it will become almost an extension of your glorious fingertips. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> right? Of course. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'm going to set these aside. I'm not going to talk much about the wooden ones, but what I want to focus on, oh, I guess I can hang these back up where they were. Those don't get used as much, but these are the primary users, okay? This is the most common style, and so I want to go with these. Now, these also have flat soles, but this one that I meant to mention, it's got flat soles, and it's very similar to this one. It has almost all the same features, the same cap, the same blade, the same, you know, um, what do they call that treatment on rifles and all that? Uh, hatching or something like that. Um, Some of you will say, is it cross hatching? They got the same decorative treatment there, but you can see the difference. The main difference is in the shape of the handle. These have a little of a gooseneck to them where the other has the straight handles. This is fine. They would work almost exactly the same, except on a flat surface, if you were doing something flatter, you can't get your fingers down under this one where the
the way these handles are up, I could get at a flat surface without dragging my fingers. So this works great for actual round objects like spokes. Thus, the name. <laughs> so the name obviously came about from shaping spokes or making old tires, you know, up tires. <laughs> Rubber tires. They were that works so good. No, I'm making uh, spoked wagon wheels and all that good stuff. You know, so the old wheels were wooden. And so you had the center shaft and then you had some heavy stout spokes going out to the rim. And quite often those spokes were rounded in the tenon shaped with spoke shapes. And often done on a special seat that held the piece in front of you and you could push out and lock it in place called a shave horse. If you're doing Windsor chair making or any kind of spindle type chair making, a shave horse is essential. You really want to have one. They look cool too. I don't have one because I don't do enough of that style of work. I will jerry-rig like a, a clamp in the vise when I do and sit on a stool and just go. It's not as fast as efficient because you've got to reach and open the vise where this, the shave horse has this very cool uh, lever where your feet just release and then it releases the piece and you push and it's locked again. So pretty cool, but that's, you'd be so well equipped if you had a shave horse and a spoke shave. You could just go to town and be dangerous. All right, so we're going to look at these two um, styles here. I actually used this one for years and years, probably, well, at least 10 to 15 years before I got one that had these adjustment nuts on there. So you see, this is really the same spoke shave. In fact, the Stanley number is number 51. Dick Butkus, for those of you who used to watch football in the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> I had a poster of him on the wall. Even though I was from New England. Um, I know you probably hate me because of that. Football-wise, other parts of the country are really got a problem with New England Patriots. I, I understand that. I understand that. But nobody had a problem. I don't think much anymore. No, not much anymore. Why, one year? <laughs> no, but nobody had a problem when we were going 1 in 15 or 1 in, what was it? No, we only played 14. Whatever. They were a laughing stock of the league for a long time. Thus, Dick Butkus was my football linebacker hero. Anyway, I'm getting a little off topic. <laughs> so that's the number 51, straight, direct, right in your face. The number 151, same, but has these sweet little adjustment knobs. So there's two little grooves in the iron that allow you to advance and recede the blade with much more control. So check this out. This one, I'll take off the lever cap. It's a very simple um, tool. Just easy like that. <laughs> free. I don't know why this is sticking. I gotta loosen the screw a little bit. No rehearsal. <laughs> I think I switched lever caps by accident with the other one. All right, so there we go. You just have the spoke shave itself. This angle right here is like on a, on a um, plane. This would be considered the frog holding the iron at the desired angle, which appears to be, I was trying to look at it. It, it looks like 45 degrees. You know, I didn't even think about it. That much, but these are this one's fairly steep. I could probably do a little check on that. I would say it is just eyeballing it. And then you have the lever cap that goes on top and then pops on there easily and threads in and snugs up. That's it. But there's no depth adjustment on this guy, so we'll come back to him 
in a little while. All right, this one is the, uh, the LX model. It's the upstyle model for those of you. I mean, you could see yourself in this one, but what would it take to get you in this car? So this one has the two grooves for the neurals, and I don't think it's that much more money. It's the 151. I might have already said that. The Stanley 151. So you get the 51 and the 151. Each one works fine. Do you know where you got these? Um, I think I got it. I can't remember where I got this one. I think I probably got it at flea markets or something like that. You can find them at flea markets, online. eBay is a great source, or antique tool stores, like or antique um, of any kind. They usually have a section of woodworking tools. And these are very common. I mean, they were all over the place. The state so, sales are good, too. Yeah, any kind of like auctions or woodworking or, I mean, probably the one adver advertiser. That's going back. I meant to say Craigslist. Is one advertiser still around? I think so. And New England. But Craigslist and uh, Marketplace and eBay. I mean, just look for old tools. This is the one, if you can find one, it's, it's really nice to have that adjustment. But, um, is that I mean, the 151 you're showing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, what's the name of it? Record also makes a really nice plane. So Record was the competitor to uh, Stanley. They came along, I think, a little after them. But their numbering system is very similar. I think it's the A151. They have two different metals for the bodies. So you can look that up. Um, and they have a 51 without the knurled knob. So the Record ones are, are nice as well. All right. So it's a pretty simple process, really, because there's not a lot of moving parts to set up. You got the iron, and you got the lever cap, and you just got to make sure that iron is sharp. Now, here's the challenge with spoke shave irons. They're short. So you don't have the advantage of that long iron that goes into most planes. And this is what makes it a little trickier to sharpen. So this one, quite often what I'll do is I'll grind it, but then I'll freehand sharpen it most of the time, you know. And so this one, if you zoom in, you want to zoom in on this? I, I was. But oh, sorry. You'll see that the bevel is a bit rounded. See how the bevel, just from me freehanding it time after time after time, you will not be able to hold it dead flat on that bevel. And eventually, you'll kind of round it over a little bit. So even though this is sharp and working OK, it's a good time to demonstrate taking it back to the grinding stone and honing it. Like, let's say you buy one at a flea market, and you get it, and it's, and it's a little older, um, needs to be sharpened. By the way, if you're looking at them and you see that the iron has pittedness to it, like little craters on there, on the back especially, if there's little craters along that, don't buy it. Or else you'll have to get a replacement iron. Because even if you sharpen it, if those craters are deep enough, they're just going to be like a gouge in the leading edge. Because it's, a sharp edge is a combination of two surfaces, the flat back and the bevel cut. So you've got to hone both surfaces to make a beautiful edge. So you can imagine if the back had like little pittedness on it, you're never going to get that flat. And so when you read the, the surface, you're going to see it go along, and it's going to have like a little chunk taken out of it because all the metal's not there. So avoid that if you can. But they do sell these aftermarket as well. And I am sure, I know there was some, there's, there's a number of websites that specialize in Stanley. I can't think of it right now. Stanley Tool History, Stanley Tool Parts. If any of you out there, I know some of you are into this. And uh, Dave, if you're watching, I know you're into this. If you could just uh, leave uh, 
the link to where people can learn more about where to access parts for these spoke shapes and maybe some Stanley parts and, and maybe some record. If you guys have information, that would be helpful. All right, so when you go to sharpen this, um, I like to try to keep it square because it'll, you have a certain margin where if this gets out of square, it's not going to get true across the mouth of the, the sole there. That's the opening, it's called the mouth. So um, I'm gonna take a little square and check it out. And that's almost square, I'm a little higher on this side. So I'm gonna take this opportunity when we go to grind to try to take a little more off there and I'll bring my square with me over to the grindstone. Let's go over to the grindstone, boys and girls. Okay. Well, what do you know? Here it is, right here. It just moved from its other home, and I brought it over. Yeah. So I've got um, two different types of stones on here. This is a. Is it the Norton? I think it's a Norton. You have to be old enough to know what that means. Norton. Um, but this one, what is this? I think it's a 120 grit. It might, but or it's either 100 or 120, I think. And over the Norton, and in this blue, it, it runs fairly cool. It's decent, but they get kind of wacky and out of shape, and you have to keep refreshing them. They're nice, and it's what I've always used. I splurged before the most recent uh, wood turning class we had last summer and picked up a CBN wheel. I think it's called cubic boron, what's the, what's the N stand for? Nitrate? <laughs> I feel like saying nitrate. Someone's gonna catch me on that. But anyway, that's what makes up the crystals on there, which are very sharp. The crystals are on there like, almost like diamond, you know? So. The nice thing about it is it cuts cooler, so you don't, you're way less likely to burn your edges. And it also never gets smaller. It never goes out of flat like these do. But they're a little pricey. Um, this one is a 180 grit. Really great. I mean, I love it. I mean, it, it cuts fast and it's not too coarse. It's not too coarse to leave a, uh, a jagged edge. So I go right from this on when I'm turning, I'll sharpen lathe chisels right here and go right to the lathe. There's no, there's no need to change. That's with the gouges. I have another method too, one of those uh, sanding setups for the lathe chisels as well. So I'm gonna use this and in order to do this kind of sharpening, just look how short this is. It's not like we have the advantage of this longer tooled handle or like I said, a plain iron. So we've got to hold it here. So you don't want a large gap between here and here. If you've got the kind of tool rest that forces you to have a large gap, that's not good. You could build an auxiliary table, like a, I've done this with pieces of plywood, where you take a like a, it might take you a half inch piece of Baltic or something. You could stick it to your plate here and have it extend and go around and cut an under angle. You can get a really close tolerance if you modify your tool rest. But it's kind of a hassle and hopefully you have something that's this small. Now one thing that'll make this easier is given that we have to slide this across and we want control. See how I'm sliding it and it's kind of, it's not super smooth. It's starting and stopping a little bit. I want to control it. So you actually want to wax the, the table. And you'd think wax being slippery would give you less control, but this is one of the times it gives you more. It's the same with your table saw and joiner. You want to keep everything really slick because when you're fighting it, um, I'll put a little on the, on the blade too. When you're fighting it, it's, it gets dangerous. You want everything to move Whoa, whoa, <laughs> it's like I'm skating. All right, it's not that bad, but anyway. All right, so 
Just ignore my black and blue fingernail there. I did a bonehead thing yesterday and hit it with a little hammer. There goes my hand modeling career. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so I'm going on here and I'm going to very lightly pass. Now, I don't want to put any pressure out beyond the edge. All my pressure is down here. And I'm going to start. And if I make a light cut with wax, I have much more control to make a nice light pass. I'm going to try to stay as straight as I can. This is a super wide wheel, so it gives you a reassurance that you're going to be having it in good position. I, we don't have a link to this one. The last time I looked, it wasn't, this exact one wasn't available. But if you look up on CBN wheels, you'll see a variety up there. And you'll notice they're not cheap, but um, you'll only buy one wheel. You know, these wear out. These actually can explode on you. Now I sound like I'm trying to sell you the wheel. <laughs> Is it worth it? You know, what if your child was working out with you? One of these exploded. Oh, this is actually the way to go. <laughs> this is nice. And I, once again, I used 180 grit, if that is a question. I think that if you're going to get just one grit, that's the one to go with. All right, here we go. I'm going to very lightly pass and just try to make a nice. Oh, I should say something about the angle. Um, I think grinding these anywhere between 20. I try to go between 25 and 30 degrees, okay? And then when I go to the honing or I end up lifting a little more. So if you're around 30 to finish or even over that, it's not a problem. The, the thing is, a thinner angle, like, a, like 25 degrees, a thin little 25 degree bevel is going to be sharper, right? The lower, thinner it is, it's sh more sharp, but it's also more fragile, and it will dull or ding faster. So anywhere between 25 and 35, technically, is a good cutting edge. The 35 degree angle will last longer because it's steeper and there's more metal coming into the point. But it's technically not quite as efficiently sharp. So I'm right at, right here, I'm, I think I'm just under 30 degrees the way it's laying on here now. <coughs> All right, here we go. Okay, let's head back to the bench. <coughs> the other thing about the CBN wheels are they're very heavy or heavier, so that will run for a long time without a break. Getting a nice breeze here. Can you hear it? Yeah, I'm getting a nice breeze from it. Oh, uh, good. Tom, um, I've got a couple questions. Can you explain how, uh, about the angle? Did you talk a lot about the angle here? Chris is asking what the angle is between them. Yeah, I did mention that. You did, It's okay. 25 to 30. Yeah, I told you. And can the CBN be used on tool steel? Um, there's a certain type of steel 
I think it's, you'll have to check it, I, I forget. It's made for high speed steel primarily. Um, someone will have to verify, I forget what I read, I haven't had it in a long time, but it's, it's great on high speed steel, steel tools because it won't overheat them and cuts really fast. But if the iron, like if the tool rest hits it, it actually, I'm pretty sure it's that, will destroy the wheel, will ruin it. Um, I'm not sure about carbide. Somebody have to say something that knows more about, are they carbide friendly? Plain irons, all right. Oh sure, plain irons. Any kind of high speed steel or tool steel in general, like chisels, um, yeah, any, anything like that. Use it with low carbon. Right, like the, like the iron the, that's made up of the, uh, they, they warn you about your, your uh, tool brush touching it. So something about it hitting those cutting edges on there ruins them. All right, Chris, so. Chris is asking, when you say 25 to 30 degrees, is that measured? Uh, yeah, you can, you can check it a number of ways, Chris. And the grinder speed while you're at it too. Um, this grinder is a standard. Um, it's a 3500 RPM, and it's an eight-inch CBN wheel. Let's see. Um, I had a. Maybe I got it under here. Yeah. All right. So I cut these little reference sticks. Like this is. Um, where I cut this piece to a 25 degree angle. I mean, you could do it on a chop saw, maybe, let's see. It's a little tricky on a chop saw or on a fence on a cross cut sled. Um, but, or you could just make a line and cut it on a bandsaw and then hit it with a hand plane. And then you can check it with one of these little um, protractors. And when I get it right to where it's flat on there, I can read it's 25 degrees over here. So what I do is I put it on the tool rest. This is 25, that's 35. And I'm going to see the stone. I have to think about the thickness of my iron. So when I put my, my iron on the tool rest, it's touching the stone right at the very bottom, just that bottom 16th or so. So when I set this up, if I want a 25 degree angle, I want the radius of the stone to be hitting flat right on that very bottom to establish a 25 degree angle. That makes sense? And then if I wanted the 35, I would go this way and I have to go up steeper. And again, I'm focusing right on that little point there, okay? So I just had this. I didn't have a 30 degree, but I steepened it up slightly beyond the 25. All right, so I'm going to, I made this little tool holder. My, my stones are usually over there and I'm fixed, but I went the extra mile for you tonight and made this nice little platform. Okay, so what I'm going to do is use water stones for this treatment and same as when I've talked about other tools, I'm going to use these Japanese water stones. You could do this on an oil stone as well. You do it on a diamond plate. Um, there's a lot of, you could do it on sandpaper method, like there's quite a few. The water stones are really effective, fast, and, and trustworthy. So I'm using these Ohishi stones, Japanese stones, excuse me, and um, they are, you can get them at, at Lee Nielsen, and we have a link for a combination stone there. And then there's also a link to Lee Nielsen where you can get the 10,000 grit stone, which is pretty sweet. But generally, when, when you're working with water stones, you want to you have, it's nice to have at least two grits, like a 1,000 and a 6,000. Okay, or a thousand and an eight thousand. You can jump that far, or 
uh, you could go with three grits, where you have a thousand, something in the middle, around six or whatever, and then, and then you have a uh, ten thousand. So it could be a thousand, six, four, whatever. I happen to have a three thousand in my middle, <laughs> so I'm going from thousand, three thousand to ten thousand, and it's kind of a bigger jump here. But this is such a beautiful fast cutting stone; it's amazing. Um, they are a little pricier again, but um, there, and there are a lot of other stones available. But I think the combination stone we link you to is the Ohishi 1000-6000. That's a great combo, and it's not that bad because you get two stones in one. Now, the other thing about water stones is you've got to keep them flat, and that can be a problem. You know, you've got to have something that keeps them flat. And I had, um, you can get these ceramic, like, not ceramic, they're, they're just these aggressive flattening stones, but the, th the problem with those is that they can go out of flat as well, and it gets to be like, wait a minute. They only have one job. Yeah, just stay flat, please. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't. So um, that's the thing. The, the nature of these water stones is that, the, especially the more coarse grit, like the thousand grit here, it you can soak them in water or you can, this one, look at the water disappear. They're permeable, so the water is actually soaking into the stone. See it going away right there? I'm not, not because it's going off the end. It's actually soaking in to the stone. But these have the nice density. Like if this is a cheaper stone, that would have disappeared really fast. Had more like air gaps in it. So... The ohishi, they say you don't have to keep them soaked all the time. You can just spray them when you're ready. But here's the 3,000. Wow, look at that. 3,000 goes faster than 1,000. So I'm going to spray those. The 10,000, you definitely don't have to spray. Tom, I got it. Ed's asking, what about cross-grit contam contamination when using combo stones? Is that a problem, or how do you contain it? Yeah, when you flip it over, you have to be careful not to flip it. In a, if you don't... You're always trying to think about not getting the coarser granular stone onto the finer one. So when you flip it, flip it to another place and then flip it back. So it's always just not getting contaminated that way. And you can always wipe it off. But when you flatten it, you can flatten it with a flattening stone or my, my um, angels, whatever, sent me this recently. You know who you are. Thank you very much again. This is a, this is, I held off getting one of these for so long and someone heard me and were wonderful to send me this gift. This is a Dia Flat um, 95 lapping plate. Um, they're, they're like $200, but it's a diamond plate. It's a little over 200 actually. And the 95, there's a 95 and there's a 120 micron. The 95 micron equates to like 177 grit, or about 180. The 120 micron is larger crystal, so it's a coarser grit. It equates to 138 grit, or 140. I'm telling you that. <laughs> the camera lady's like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm laughing at the comment you made earlier about what? how you don't burn out over. Oh, I do. Uh, well, it's the, it's the micron that it annoys me that I don't know what a micron is, you know, okay. and uh, I want to convert it to the grit texture. But um, if you have the choice, it's a little more money for the 95. It's a better grit because the, the other one, the 120, is a little more coarse and it takes off too much of your stone. So I really appreciate these uh, gift givers <laughs> giving me the 95. So it's really sweet. It cuts so much faster and its tolerance is really flat. Like I don't even have to wet this and I'll just rub it on there and I'm done. I did this a little earlier. So notice I don't care about contamination from the finer to the coarser. So whenever I flatten my stones, I always start with the finest and then move here. This one I wet getting a little, well, I'm <laughs> gumming it up from my previous 
I gotta wet, put a little water on here. It gets like suction down there. I did just flatten these, so I'm not gonna do this too much. And then lastly, I'll hit the thousand grit. This is just a beautiful flat lapping plate. It's just perfect. So look, I have like a 3,000 slurry on there on my 1,000. Now, often I would just hand do this, but I'm going to use, if you're going to hand tune it, you're just going to hold it. I'll show you this, and then I'll show you the, the honing guide. You, I just rock it until I feel it land on the flat. So right there. And then I try to lock my fingers and kind of my elbows to my side and just move as uniformly as I can. You saw how I showed you how it was rounded earlier. It's hard to keep it perfect. So then you're going to go around and then you could flip on the back. You know, I'd do it a little more than that maybe. But let's see what we did. I don't think I'll be able to show you it, but... Yeah, I can see I got a nice hone kind of out to the end there, but it's all by hand, you know? So the thousand grit where it looks nice and kind of satiny out near the edge, and then you can see a little bit of the, um, the hollow grind. Anyway, I would then go enough there and then move to my next stone. Now, you also want to hone the back, and because of the way this is held into the into the plane at a steep angle like this, the back does not have to be dead, dead flat. So when you hone the back, you can lift this very slightly to make sure you're honing right out to the edge. If you keep it really dead flat, it's hard sometimes to make sure you get the polish all the way out to the end. But don't lift it much. Um, you can put a little spacer rule in there or something, but I tend to just slightly lift it and hone it just for quick, going quickly. So I would just go that way right through my grits to the end. But I'm going to show you an accessory here. Um, if you try to use our standard honing guide like this, let's do this. There, this is the one I use with my plain irons. You hold it in there, but because it's so short here, when it pitches, it it pitches kind of steeply. And so to get it at the right angle, you have to get it out there and you can't really hold it well. So some brilliant person made these little extenders. And this is the Lee Nielsen holding jig that I almost, I really honestly, I don't use it that much because I'm a free hander. <laughs> You'll probably do that too. I've, you can freehand these, okay? But I am going to bring it over here. And I made a little piece of tape there that would help me. If I hold this flat and extend the cutting iron just to touch the tape, I know that's the right amount of extension to give me the angle that I had to equate to what I was doing on the grinder. I was trying to correct that little slope in my blade and I think I slightly overcorrected it so anyway there I go so now I'm in there I'm gonna do the same thing now look though I don't have to worry about it rocking I'll get a really nice flat so it's rolling on the wheel and it's holding it right at that angle and I set that up earlier to equate to the grindstone angle I'm just gonna go ahead quickly and Here's where you you got to be careful about contaminating going to the next grit. It's hard to be like super perfect about everything there, but um, let's see. I can't. You're not going to be able to see that one. I'll, I'll show you on the last one when it's really shining. Let me just put a little water on here. Just helps keep things moving, cutting a little more. I was looking to see where it's cutting because you want to make sure it's in the right position. Because I free-handed it first, I was not sure. Do you use 
use the ruler to sharpen your irons? David's asking. The ruler? Don't you use the ruler to sharpen your irons? I think you mean the back of the ruler, maybe? Um, I don't know. That's on the flat back when you're, you can use the ruler underneath if it's a plain iron, like uh, not a block, low angle block plane. All right, I can see that I'm a little, I'm not quite getting it, so I gotta back it in a little to bring it up a little steeper. Steve's suggesting that there's a tip here. You can do the Charlesworth trick with steel rule on the end of the stone to raise the blade. Yeah, I was mentioning that one earlier. I was trying to say that you could put a thin piece of steel, but because it's so thin, it's not the same as a plain iron that extends across the whole way. Uh, they're saying it's called the ruler trick. You put the ruler on the back to tilt the iron. Forward. Yeah, okay. exactly. You got this ruler like this, and it goes on there, and then it tips when you're flattening the back. But like I was saying, I tend to, on these little, little things, I just slightly lift it, and it, it does the trick. <laughs> Got to make sure I had it pitched high enough. I don't think I still do. I must have. Um, didn't look like I, I had it quite set right on that tape marker. That feels like it's good. Okay. So you don't need to spend much time on each stone because once you've honed that, you get it out to the edge, you're good to go. There we are. And now I'm going to move to the next one. So I've got to uh, make sure that I've moved as much as I can of that grit. So I've got to get it off the wheel and off the iron. Now we'll go to the 3000. These cut really fast. It's really it's such a pleasure to use. That's good. I'm slightly low in the middle, which is where I don't want to be, but I'm going to just go with the demo right now and uh, show you the taking it through the grits. And then lastly, I come to the 10,000. I want to have a, a few minutes to show you technique using it, so I'm just going to get it done. And this is just an amazing stone. Such, cut so quickly and so fine. For such a fine grit stone, it's just amazing how fast it cuts. You said, uh, I Got was asking, that's a Lee Nielsen. Yeah, it's the Lee Nielsen with the ex accessory uh, jaws there to sharpen spoke, spoke shape irons. It's really an amazing Did little we holder. Link that? We linked to uh, Lee Nielsen for the 10,000 grit because I couldn't find that on other places. Uh -huh. So, um, but right from Lee Nielsen's site, you can see this guide. Um, like I said, I mean, it's called what, Tom? Huh? It's called a honing guide, and you'll see that for the for doing spoke shave irons, you have these accessory jaws. The standard jaws are this length. So when I'm when you've got regular plain irons in there, these just exchange out very quickly. It's beautifully machined, everything about it, and then. You can get reset up. I didn't really get close on now. That is it okay. Yeah, I think so. Well, I just had these right here. 
this little short switches out if you're in. so okay. all right so now once before I move on I want to make sure I get the back so I know it's pretty close I'm gonna just go to the 10,000 grit and hold it like I said see how the the rule trick on this actually keeps it quite steep where on a regular iron you're over here so I just hand do it. I can feel just pressure on the end without lifting it hardly at all. All right, that felt like we got it. Man, it's such a beautiful stone. You know, I've, I've used the, I bought a whole bunch of uh, king stones years ago and used them with classes so they're they're adequate but they're you notice the difference in quality of stones when you go from those all right so can you see where we're at can you see it gleaming i can't yes if I'm, going. I'm going to now just strop it the last thing so i've got the strop this is just a piece of what is this it's basswood um, that I flattened and then I I rubbed some jeweler's rouge some green jeweler's rouge on there so instead of leather you can get you can use just a nice piece of wood like that and I think basswood works great cherry's fine you know uh, poplar something with a closed grain like that and so we're going to let me make sure my hands are a little cleaner and for this, I just freehand it, hold it up on the bevel like we did before, and you pull or against the cutting edge. I'm pushing, but I'm kind of pulling away from the cutting edge, okay? You want to do this, you know, 10 times anyway. You can go crazy, but got a question while you're doing that, Tom. Yeah. Do you want, uh, Bill's asking, do you want to feel a burr before moving up grits? Um, you will. I. You can actually see. You could reach and feel it if you wanted to. But when I was looking at it, I was looking to see the polish all the way across the end. So I could see the grit that I was working with had, had moved all the way to the edge. So that's the main thing. You just, whether you feel the burr or see that it's all the way to the edge, it's the same approach. But yeah, that, that's a way you can confirm as well. All right, so I'm, I'm stropping the front and the back, and I now have a gorgeous polished edge. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. And on the back as well. So that is a sharp edge, okay? All right, so I'm gonna set the side. Let's load it up and try it out. With the few minutes we have remaining. All right, so <laughs> I'm going to get it into this one with the little knurled uh, adjustment knobs. Set it in so it's sitting over the grooves. Set in the iron, or the, I mean the leather, the cap. It's too tight, you can just loosen that screw like I had to do earlier. I'm just going to lightly snug it. And I like to hold it up to a, a light colored wall or something. I can't really show you this, but because the way I have to sight it, it's really it's hard to see on the camera. I'm just looking for the blade to be very slightly above the sole of the plane. And I can snug it up. What? Looks like your eye is closed. Eyes are closed on this side. Well, my other eye. Just open. feeling it, feeling your way. I am. I can just. <laughs> Samurai. I know. I'm like the the blind master on kung fu. There we go. That looks pretty close. So you can verify if, um, well, if you have a thin piece of, let's say you have a thin piece of. Pine like, like this. this is a very thin piece. I'll go 
I'm going to hold it over to this edge, and then I'll do this edge. And I want to see the same thickness shaving. Whoops. They feel very similar. They might measure slightly different, but I think we're pretty even. So it's good enough. All right? <laughs> now, let's bring over one of the... One of the best ways, like, people aren't making spoked wheels as much these days, you know. But for a furniture maker, where it really comes in handy is rounding over surfaces. Um, and for 18th century furniture, I used it a lot because you're always rounding cabriole legs. You know, you start out with a square, and then you'd get that rounded and blended to actually an appearing like a round down here. So it wasn't, this style is sawn and then shaped, and it appears round, um, mainly by the use of a spoke shave. So this is a pattern leg for that I was working out for this leg in cherry. This is in poplar, and it's for a, uh, a sofa table. I think it ends up being a table about 28 inches high, like a, behind a sofa. It's a, Beautiful table. I, it's about 48 long, I think. And um, someday we might do this one. I wonder if people are still into Queen Anne. If so, let me know. I, you know, it's weird how things come in and out of fashion. Everybody, everybody wanted uh, once more Shaker and and Craftsman furniture in fine woodworking. So. That's why you see more articles like that these days. And before you move on, can I ask a couple questions? Sure. Bob's asking, bevel up or bevel down? It's from back when you were. Oh, yeah, Bob. Uh, the bevel goes down. Because you're at a 45 degree angle, just like a standard bench plane, the bevel has to go down. Because if you put it the other way, uh, let's see, does it work? No, it does work. Yeah, the bevel goes down. That's the way it works on a uh, on a spoke shave. Okay. If you're ever in doubt, um, the the writing on the iron is on the side that should face out, which will show you it's beveled down. Okay, Steve's asking, do you also prep the bottom of the spoke shave? Oh yeah, you want to make sure the sole is flat. I didn't mention that, but this one is. You can put a little wax on there as well usually before you put the iron in. Similar to a plane, you know, you just want to make sure. It's not as critical that the sole is flat because it's such a short sole and it's made for more shaping. But you do want to quickly flatten it and then give it some wax. OK. Uh, what do you do to clean the slurry off the stones? What do you clean it off with? I just spritz it with water and then take a rag. Um, I mean, if you had more high-powered water, you could do that. You could put it under the sink. If you have, like, a, a rough sink you can use, you can rinse them off that way. Um, but other than that, you didn't have to just wipe them off. So. One more question. Okay. Sorry. Um, do you know what grit the CBN wheel is? He sees grits from 60 to 1,000. Do you remember? Yeah, I was mentioning Rich that said? the 180 grit is what I have on there, and I love it. I think it's the right grit for a lot of different tools. You know, because it cuts faster than the standard, it leaves a nice surface. You can go right to, your lathe chisels can go right from that to the work. It's beautiful. All right, so I'm gonna set this, this is the way we used to always uh, set it up for shaping, um, legs of all kinds and we just get the piece in here it's like having an auxiliary vise but if you notice here this is it was first sawn out and then I created a facet basically turn it into an octagon down here and these are guidelines showing me where I don't want to go beyond so it goes from square to having the corners knocked off, and then to rounding those corners. 
So these two sides are still at the faceted, the octagonal stage, but the guidelines are there. So let me, I'm going to go ahead and put it in my clamp, and let's just round up. Let's use our spoke shave. Man, it's been a while since I've done a good queen in leg. Let's give it a shot. You don't want to over tighten it. It would take a lot to crack that, but it's possible. All right, so I've already got the facet, so I'm going to put it up on the edge and just come down. I mean, look how fast that is. And it's just beautiful. And I, I'm going to bring it over. What number are you using there, hon? Number? Number Spoke what? Shave. This is the 151. Yeah, the one with the knurls. Um, that's the one we sharp. We just sharpened. Now I can feel I'm going against the grain here. Can now, you talk a little did you see how we got in here? This is a steep corner. I can't go any further because the this is where you can. I would either use rasps, or this is where that rounded sole would come in. Something like that. Okay. Here I'm going to start going against the grain, so I want to come this way. I don't really find these to save you a ton of time. Is that the 152? This is, I don't even think this, oh yeah, no, it's a 63. Okay. But this, I, I, don't, I rarely use this actually. Really, this is the only time and, see, I can only use it there, a little bit there, and then it's rasping anyway, right? you got to rasp to blend that kind of spoon foot in to the round ankle right here. So once I've gotten the spoke shaving done, then I would go to the rasps. But this does, spoke shaving here saves you a lot of time with rasping. So it's just like you keep knocking off the previous facet. So I'm going right across the apex of the previous one few strokes and then I can start leaning a little more and before you know it I have a rounded surface there that's nice and then you can push it a lot, a lot of times it feels better to push you push or pull here I have to be careful because I don't want to cut into that nice turning there but that's what it, you need to blend is anybody saying they would like to do a Queen Anne? Or is that too old fashioned? Uh, Mike said he already made one a while ago. Oh, okay. All right, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Head of the game. I enjoyed okay. it. They are fun. I mean, it's, it's funny how it dropped off in popularity. Like, all of a sudden, a lot of people wanted to get rid of it, and the younger generation isn't buying the old antiques. So. Is there anything they need to know about how you're holding that? Um, yeah. Oh, should say that. So I'm holding it with, you know, you have this little curve for your thumbs, but I'm always feeling that the sole is sitting flat. That's why this one is so easy to use. It's almost like a potato peeler or a vegetable peeler. You just, you can feel the, when it's flat, it's referencing it just right for that cutting edge to be up. So that's one way you can use to round off. This is all just spoke shaved to this point. And then it would get lightly filed and card scraped and sanded. Then we have this example from the course we just had where we took a more contemporary, this is the modern writing desk if you haven't seen that. It was a blast. I love this design. It's, I can't wait to see it finished. And remember, if you didn't hear me earlier, we're having the unveiling of the writing desk next Thursday night on our 100th episode. <laughs> so anyway, this was sawn out square, I mean square in shape here, but of course we have this beautiful subtle taper and curved leg. And then we did this pillowing effect where we made some guidelines. Um, We made these center lines and down the, the center line here, okay? And then we made one over here. 
And then we made this other little line here to show us the depth we wanted to go. So holding your finger there, made a little depth line. And then you would flip it over and do the same on the opposing edge. So that gives me the, the limits to where I want to go with a spoke shape to create a pillowed surface. So let's just do this just a couple swipes. Oh, actually, I already rounded that top, so what was I thinking? Lots of interest in the Queen Anne. Really? OK, good. Well, I'd like to do one at some point. I mean, we've got some other. We have that shaker chest project coming up. I will mention that at the end. But now again, this is not going to work well because I, I took it out of the square already. I'm going to snug it a little more. That'll work. OK, I'm going to hold it slightly up at an angle. Look how beautiful that works. Look at the shavings. They're like little curly cues. So you could be more aggressive with it. It's so light, I can do it with one hand. Well, not that great. See, I can't, rep I can't feel it flat on the sole as well with one hand going through that curve. But I would hold it at that angle for a while until I got to my guideline. And then I start flattening it out. If you want to see this whole process, it's not too late. If you love the table, the writing desk, that project is available now as a video series along with the full-size drawings. Lots of hours. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The other night, we went almost three hours for the finish. But anyway. Good stuff. Yeah, it was. So we would go like that, both sides. And then I filed and card scraped and sanded. And we end up going from a square leg like that to a pillowed leg. This is the same leg with the pillowing treatment. So this gives you this really sweet effect. If you look at it, can you see that angle? Lift it up. There. Can you see it? Yeah. So you see how much, it doesn't look like there's that much there because we didn't even do come over an eighth of an inch, but it gives it this sculptural feeling that changes the whole game. So these legs here have that pillowing effect on them. And then we did the same up here on the, on the top. And what a difference. So this top edge will also get this kind of pillowing effect where that edge comes down and over, similar to this one we used as our demonstration the other night to pillow that soft edge. And this is done with a spoke shave again. So spoke shaves are sculptural tools. So you can see how it just took it back. So it's going to create this illusion of this soft kind of inviting top, but into this gorgeous figured wood, which just gives it a, um, I don't know, it's like you're taking this hard expected material that you usually see with hard edges and has this gorgeous figure and you're creating like a soft appearing, almost like fabric or like this air in it. You know, so it changes the whole s sense of, of how it looks. It gives it an organic, natural look. What do you remember was your first challenge among your first challenges when you're first learning to use a spoke shave? Uh, just how to get a clean shaving off there. So um, there's, that's the primary way is shaping legs like that. But let me show you just with some scrap pieces here. So just take a couple short pieces here. Here's a piece of cherry. I'll look for the grain coming up like that. So it's first just making sure the sole is flat on the, so see, I'm getting a full shaving. And if I angle, I'm more on the corner. 
but I'm getting a full shaving because I'm keeping it flat. If you rock forward, you lose contact, and if you rock backwards, you lose it. So that's the main thing is just set up some wood and practice just rounding it off. Before you know it, it's going to feel very second nature. It's not, it's not a steep learning curve. But the thing about them is you can set them very aggressively too. Look at, I'm going to jack these out. So I was taking a nice light shaving there. Um, control. You want to have more control when you get close to the shape of like a, a Queen Anne leg. But sometimes you want to move, remove material more quickly. So you hear the difference? I'm taking these heavier shavings. But because they're not wide, they're fast and easy. So look at, we just created a radius edge. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. That fast. And then we did the same technique on our stool that we did a while back. Remember we, these are not turned legs. We sawed them out to a taper and then trimmed the corners off and then they were all just spoke shaved like old wagon wheel spokes. I mean, these are probably similar to the dimension in their white oak, like a lot of those were. And then we left the facets on there. I don't know if you can see it. See the facets? Mm -hmm. To give more texture and kind of like an old feeling to it with the smooth walnut top of the seat. Same down here on the footrest. This is the shop stool. If you haven't seen it, we have plans for this as well. Um, and of course. What else did I want to show you? Oh, the last thing is my good old standby. This was my first one. So it was cha more challenging to set because you didn't have the control of the knurled knobs. But if you have a flat piece of material, like, let's use this. The way you can set the blade is loosen, loosen it up so it can really float, right? Bring it down, holding the sole flat on a piece of flat material. Let the blade just sit at the ground level, basically, parallel with the bottom, and then just snug it up. And the snugging up actually causes the blade to slightly protrude. So you should be pretty close there. But you know what I often found myself doing was just looking over the top of it and adjusting. But let's see, just from that method, uh, let's use this. Let's see if that did anything. Yeah. yeah. So that set it really nicely. So that's one way to set it. So if you're fighting it and getting a lot of chatter, you probably have the blade out too far. So you really want to have a sharp iron like we just did. If it also feels like it's dragging a little, you can wax that sole. And don't take a lighter shaving. And uh, make sure it's even the way we did. And you get the most beautiful results. Dean's asking, do you ever set one side of the blade heavy and the other side lighter? Not usually, Dean, because you kind of lose control. You can't really, usually you're, you're feeling the angle by how you're pitching the spoke shave. If you've got this additional angle on the blade, it makes it a little challenging. I'm usually trying to even it up and have, if I want a thicker cut, I'll just advance the blade parallel to the sole, and then you can really have control and know where you are just by feeling the angle of it on the work. All right, so those are the ones that I would go for is the standard kind of gooseneck. If I was buying just one and I was tuning one up, this style is your, is your essential beginning place. And then you can add, as you go to flea markets and 
you know, shop around on eBay and all those other means of picking up old tools, you can add rounded soles and curved and maybe you want to collect them. But I have several more, but I, the only ones that go in the cabinet are these. And these are my starting lineup over here. And sometimes I'll have this one set really fine and I'll just leave this one more aggressively set. So if I want to go fast, I just grab this and I don't have to do a lot of adjusting. I do that same thing with my block plane. So this is the, this is a lesser model, but it's a great block plane. I keep that set heavy and then I have, usually my Lee Nielsen is dialed in, take a really nice fine shaving. So I just use them in combination. I don't have to stop and fiddle with it because again, I love the tools as a means to do the work. And that's what we're after, It's making beautiful work. So we want to understand and use our tools to our best advantage to be creative and effective with our time in the shop. I do want to share that if uh, I put it in the chat, but for those who watch later and don't see that, uh, we are going to be making a, a big announcement this weekend and to our mailing list members. If you're not on our mailing list, Go to epicworking.com and get on that so we can communicate with you. This is a limited space kind of event we're going to talk about. That's what was that? Epic what? Epic Woodworking. I That's said it funny. I'm sure it's not. I don't know. <laughs> How do you spell that? Anyway, you think no, I would I, know how to say that word? No, I'm just kidding. I, I like to poke you. Okay. All righty then. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you find you value. Breathe and drink this stuff. Woodworking. In, I know. <laughs> if you haven't seen that name by now. Um, I hope that gives you a lot of pleasure in um, your creative journey here. And so now, from now on, when I talk about the spoke shave and I pick it up and it's working beautifully, and you want to know, you can always refer to this video to set it up and get good results. Um, but once again, the reminder for uh, new course beginning this Saturday if you're not already part of it it's the shaker chest of drawers and that will launch this Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on Eastern Standard Time so if you're on the West Coast it'll be 7 a.m. but if you miss it for any reason and you're signed up for the course it's yours you have access to those videos indefinitely mm -hmm. so you can refer to them at your own pace, uh, but if you join us live, you get to ask questions in real live time. And this is the, by far the most popular course. We've got quite a few people signed up. There is a bundle available if you go on our website at epicwoodworking.com. Go for uh, plans and you'll see the course bundle where you get the course and the video, I mean the plans and the video for a lesser price. And um, also, that chest of drawers will be featured in the next issue of Fine Woodworking Magazine. So it's all happening at once. Mm. Next week, actually, the magazine comes out. So I'm looking forward to that. And once again, next Thursday night, we will have the big unveiling of the finished writing desk. So I hope you join me for that. On behalf of the camera lady and myself, <laughs> We've really enjoyed you stopping by here at the shop, and we look forward to seeing you next week right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Appreciate you all so much. Thank you. <laughs>